Hello, Susan. Let's turn the roles around. This time I'll ask you questions. Because one of the uh, things that we're often uh, thinking about, of course, we come with a lot of theorizing, a lot of ideas about how HROs work, but how does it actually work in practice? And so my first question to you would really be, uh, to what extent do you feel that our theorizing applies to different types of uh, resource industries? And in particular, I'm thinking, does it apply to large mines as well as small mines? I think the beauty, Yolanda, of, of the high reliability organizational thinking is it applies to everyone. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what this is about, this is about obtaining an honest and deep understanding of how your operations currently run. And that's true whether you're a small quarry or a very large multinational corporation. How does it work in practice? Mm -hmm. That's your baseline. Mm -hmm. That's understanding communication flows, understanding whether what leaders say they want to achieve is what's actually being achieved at the site, understanding where trust sits or doesn't sit, understanding what level of commitment there is across your organisation or across your site. So that first part of the thinking, that baseline, is absolutely applicable everywhere. And I think if you go back and look at the Wyke and Sutcliffe Five Principles, uh, the first one of those is to be preoccupied with failure. And what that really means is to actually think about the mistakes that you don't want to, don't want to make. Yep. Be alive yep. to those possibilities. Think about your own strategies and make sure that they don't inadvertently cause those yep. mistakes. Now, if you've got one employee or if you've got several thousand employees, that way of thinking absolutely still applies. So I think that the, importance, the important thing to, I guess, convey to people in the resources sector, no matter where they sit in terms of the size of their operations, is this is about the way you lead and the way you organise and the extent to which you understand your people. Uh, and I think that that's a general message for mm -hmm. everybody. So if I understand it correctly then, that you do see that a lot of the theorising applies uh, uh, in, in uh, resource industry. Uh, but of course, I also can imagine that you have so many different groups uh, in the industry, uh, contractors, uh, staff uh, on the ground. Do you, ever, do you think that, that there is a bit of an issue of getting them all on board? Oh, look, Yolanda, I think we have to be honest about this. Not everybody comes to work with the same set of goals every day. Uh, we've all, we all bring our backgrounds and our baggage to mm, our work. Mm. Um, and it is the case that on any given day, at any given mine site, there will be people who want to achieve different things. Mm, mm. But that's yes. not a justification for not trying as leaders to create that shared sense of identity that we've been talking about. It's not an argument for avoiding the mapping that is so important. Um, I think it's incredibly useful for anyone who works in the resources sector to see their leaders deeply engaged in wanting to understand them mm, mm. and wanting to understand what they need to do to work collectively to achieve a goal. And honestly, I mean, it's far more likely that you're going to get that improved safety outcome that you're looking for, that reliable delivery of safety messages, that, that, that reduction in serious injuries that we all hope mm -hmm. to achieve if you can spend the time to engage with people, no matter whether or not they initially start by perhaps being in opposition to you. That will happen. That's the reality of the world. Um, we don't throw our hands up in the air and give up. We work harder to try to bring the groups together with a shared goal. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you have a regulator here too. So. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? How does a regulator, what, what do you hope them to pick up from the conversation we're having here? Well, regulators are organisations too, and they need to be highly reliable organisations. So the thinking mm. and the theory, I think, applies just as much to regulators as it does to companies in the resources sector. Uh, so how does a regulator be more reliable? Well, I think the first thing to say is they must be consistent. And what is poison to achieving good outcomes is inconsistency or demands that seem to change. Good law, good regulation relies on the regulator being clear, being transparent about what they're looking for and consistent in the way they go about their work. And then the people who are being regulated have got some sort of clarity about what's expected of them and they can respond accordingly. And I think the other thing to say is that regulators need to explain themselves. So mm -hmm. that if you're, if you're engaging with a company and you're saying, I want you to do this because it will make you more highly reliable, it, I think it's entirely reasonable for the companies to then turn around and say, could you explain to me why? It doesn't have to be an oppositional conversation. It's a conversation about being transparent about what you're trying to achieve 
and being consistent in the way you go about doing that. So I would like to see a situation where regulators turn their eyes inwards as well as outwards uh, and think about how they can improve their own practices. Nobody in this space is perfect. Um, if this is genuinely a shared process of moving towards a situation where we can honestly say we have dramatically reduced the injuries and incidents in the resources sector, then the regulators and the regulated need to be working together. Yeah, look, I think these are great insights about how the theorising can actually be applied and how that maps onto your experiences. So thank you very much, Susan. Thanks, Yolanda.